What's up, y'all? This training Q&A is two weeks late. I appreciate your patience. We got a lot of banger questions. I'm gonna start right off with uh, Thankrit and their question on my thoughts on structuring a full body three days per week split. I don't wanna give the plot away too much just because it's not gonna be a full body three times a week, but I do have a program coming out, a free program. I might throw it on Patreon for the five bucks. The Gaines Goblin doesn't want me giving away everything for free, but I might throw it on there for five bucks. But I can talk about some uh, general principles and things that I think. Um, full body three times a week is great. It's not the first option that I would use for someone that has specific strength training goals. So, you know, if you're wanting to structure your strength and conditioning program or your bodybuilding program around progressing a lift so that you can get bigger or stronger. It's hard to get in the frequency that you need on a full body three times per week, just because you also have to hit so many other muscles as well. And you have to have, you know, different emphases on different muscles depending upon the day, because it still has to be, you know, primary, secondary, and tertiary. That d never changes depending upon your, you know, how you want to order things. But, if you're in a few categories of people, so like an in-season athlete, fuck it, an athlete in general, um, someone that's just training recreationally that doesn't have specific strength goals and just wants to get generally bigger, um, or if you're someone that's short on time and you don't really want to go to the gym more than three times per week, and you also don't have any specific strength goals that you're willing to compromise on, full body three times a week is excellent. You can open up with like a heavy bench press one day, um, you know, like a lighter upper body movement and then a heavier squat and then like a, another light upper body movement and then a heavy hip hinge. And you know, that's how you would, you know, open up each day and then you'd have different accessories. It's really simple to work every muscle group in your body as long as you have a tearing to it. So here you might just want to break it down into different, you know, primary or secondary emphasis is. So your first full body session, it could be something like you're primarily working your upper body here, you're secondarily working your lower body here, and then you're also working your forearms, calves, and so on. Your second full body session, secondary upper body, primary squat, and then, you know, accessories for each. So you might pick one upper body and then one lower body accessory. And this is for both days. And then you'd have like a, a tertiary upper body. Tertiary means third most important, in your brain term. And you have like primary hip hinge and then accessories. Again, I'm not gonna go into detail just cause my three day, week, three day a week program isn't gonna be full body, but it is kinda gonna use some of those strategies to you know, for you guys that don't want to be in the gym four days a week or can't be in the gym four days a week. But I think it's really versatile. It's a good tool to have in your toolbox and know how to program it if you need it. Now, again, if you have specific strength goals, it's hard to get in all your bench press frequency, all your squat frequency, all your weighted pull up frequency, which you need to do those things multiple times a week to get as strong as you can at them. That's just reality. You can't really do that on a full body program without you know, overstressing yourself. Luke Williams, what do you think about the pros and cons of having long legs? I'm gonna refer you to my non-cookie cutter guide to heavy singles, I talk about that a lot there. Um, there is a new video that I'm gonna make um, talking about the different ways range of motion can impact the way that you need to program things. But just in general, I don't like to look at it as pros and cons, it's just rules and guidelines that you're, you have to follow based upon your leverage. I call it the leverage continuum. So if you're on this end and you're training with variations that favor this end, you're fucking up. So stay in your lane. Now specific rules, cause that's what we're gonna call them, that you need to follow as a long leg lifter. Typically you're gonna have more back extension in your squats. Like you're gonna have to use your back a lot more on things like high bar squats. What I really like is doing something like a mid bar squat where if you just move the bar just a touch down and you're not in a low bar position quite, 
you'll find that the bar is more over the center of your gravity. So you're able to get like that really nice looking upright squat, even if you have longer legs a lot of time. A lot of people, when I give them that, it really clicks with them for the first time in their life. Um, that's a really good variation to use. Um, you may notice that your ankle mobility isn't as good. So you're gonna wanna do things uh, to adjunct your main squatting work if you even care about doing that. Things like machines, things like single leg work where you can work in positions that are more favorable to your leverages. So might be deficit Bulgarian split squats are a favorite of mine. Hatfield lunges are fucking great for everybody. Um, and Hatfield just means that, you know, you either have a safety bar and you're holding onto the rack with one arm or you have a dumbbell in one arm and then your hand on the rack with the other. Really good exercise for pushing quad volume hip thrust, so on. So use tools available to you that don't necessarily highlight some of the areas of opportunity that you, you have because of your, your longer legs. So just keep that in mind, bro. And watch that video. It's called the non-cookie cutter guide to uh, heavy singles. It's that video where Rick is beating the shit out of his fucking dummy and he has that dumbbell in his hand and he's about to like crush it. That's the thumbnail. That's the thumbnail I use for that. Um, quacky ducky can grip chaining impact our performance positively okay definitely so grip training really helps with bench press um, really just gripping the shit out of the bar with whatever you do is just adequate grip training in my opinion unless it's for something specific like training your hook grip and your tolerance to the hook grip, then you would wanna you know, incorporate that every so often. I can make a video about that if y'all want. Um, it's gonna have like a transient effect. So it'd be like, because your grip is stronger in your bench press or your squat or your deadlift or your rows or whatever, you might have like a one or 2% improvement, rep for rep. Over time, that one or 2% difference is very fucking substantial but it's not necessary, you know, you know, you could just as easily like just chalk up a little bit on bench and use straps with your hip hinges or do a squat variation that doesn't require so much, um, so much of the same cues, like a safety bar squat, um, anything like that. It's not necessary, but it definitely can help. My only word of caution is you definitely don't wanna do so much to the point where like your grip is so fried you can't even hold the bar even with straps on your lower body day if that comes up so just keep that in mind y'all 12 11 that reminds me of fucking um skyrim the fucking the, the yarl the yarl of winterfell from the beginning of skyrim anyway he asked what are your thoughts on six times per week two hour sessions with your training and i'm smiling just because a lot of people seem to favor push-pull legs. I don't know if it's just because like we're in this weird full circle situation where push-pull legs is like meta again, but there was an era of YouTube. And just to give y'all a little history lesson because I've been watching YouTube fitness for the better part of I mean, a shit a decade and a half, but push-pull legs used to be like the meta when everybody was a bodybuilder. So it was Chris Jones doing the push-pull legs and I think Brandon Carter was doing the push-pull legs too. And then everybody was doing fucking bro splits if they weren't doing push-pull legs. What we found out over time is that it's better to have more rest days than less, unless you're like ultra specifically trying to get better at just one thing, then yeah, you can train it every day. And then even then, there's always the argument of you could just do more quality work less often and get like an equal or better result. That's up to debate. But for general strength training, there is no reason to go to the gym six times a week, especially not for two hour sessions in my opinion. Now, if you're still someone that enjoys just being physically active mostly every day, you can work in an upper lower and then have your recovery days be like active recovery sessions. So. Go ahead and knock two birds out with one stone. Let's just say you like going to the gym, okay. You don't care about the, you know, driving there and getting washed up and all that. Have that first rest day, just be have, have it be like a reverse stationary bike session. 
where you know you're physically active and you're getting tired, but you're also working those uh, tendons and joints and ligaments in your knees and your leg that tend to get fucked up if you don't attend to them. So, and then another day where you know an active recovery session for your upper body where you're doing really light dumbbell complexes where you're doing these real deep dumbbell benches for you know maybe sets of 20 and then dumbbell rows for sets of 15 or 20 and then that's your upper body recovery and you do your band push downs and your band fucking curls same kind of thing but you don't want to do heavy resistance training with the goal of fucking progressing that session six times a week four times a week upper lower is meta power lifters do it bodybuilders do it Every strength and conditioning coach I know for like, you know, football players, soccer players, wrestlers, so on, they use upper lower. So, and that's for a reason, just because it gives you three days of rest. Um, next question. DUP versus weekly undulating periodization from BQ versus gravity. Uh, Jack Hammer in the comments called you the Raider captain of <laughs> of the Noble Natties. Um, I think both are good ways of periodizing your training. I prefer DUP just because it allows you to easily have multiple training goals in one weekly cycle versus with weekly undulating periodization. Like you said, Week two is based off of week one, it's based off the of week three and so on. It's just more gigabrain than I care to make my training programs versus if I have, okay, here's one day where we're gonna do fives with this heavier exercise, and here's another day where we're gonna do tens with this lighter exercise, and this is primary and this is secondary. It's just a whole lot easier in my opinion. And a lot more beneficial, more fun too. Um, any simmers? Thanks, OG. I appreciate you, man. You always come with the positivity. Um, but he asks, will extra conditioning work have an effect on my gains, like positively or negatively? And he just went into a, you know, a little story about different conditioning that he likes to do. If you don't overdo it, extra conditioning work is great, especially if it's the kind where it's difficult and it's strenuous but it's not like you know beating up your elbows or beating up your knees to the point or your hips or whatever. To the point where now, when you go back to your upper body session, your fucking arms are fucking destroyed or your legs are destroyed on your lower body session. What it does is that conditioning increases your capacity to do work. That's why you do conditioning in the first place. So conditioning is always going to be beneficial, beneficial in a strength and conditioning program. I don't so much talk about the conditioning aspect of it. That's something that I would, you know, want to do a lot more this year, but there's not a whole lot of thought that needs to go into it. There's a lot of ways to condition your body. We'll go through different videos just for the algorithm and shit like that for people to have different, you know, flavors and spices of life. Um, but in general, that's exactly what conditioning is for. I'll have my uh, final answer on conditioning video up soon. It's one of my projects, but if you do too much, you can definitely detriment it. So if you're doing fucking brolic hill sprints where you're fucking sacrificing your soul running up the hill to the point where now you're in your lower body session, your legs feel like fucking dog food. Yes, yeah, at that point, it's hurting you. Fabio, sorry, I'm not making fun of your name, bro. It just reminds me of uh, Mario from. Uh, uh, Super Mario Brothers. Uh, it, it just made it a little funny, bro. But you had an excellent question. How do I know if I train hard enough? So the reason why I decided, because I get questions on my story that I'll just answer in the story briefly or, you know, in the polls, I'll answer them briefly. The reason why I included this here is that it's a question that many people have that is very hard, very easy to overthink. I like to make it very simple. Sometimes these, these fucking, these questions and situations we find ourselves in are very complicated just because we make them complicated. This has a simple answer. Okay, if my goal is to get stronger 
and I'm getting stronger in my training, I'm doing enough to achieve that goal. If my goal is to move this weight for 12 reps and over time increase my ability to move that for 12 reps because I'm a bodybuilder and I only train in the higher rep range, I have a video on that soon too, then you're training hard enough. If you're not progressing in your training and all of your other factors like your sleep, your hydration, your, uh, your, your fucking protein intake, your stress levels, the time of day you train, all that is in order. It's not necessarily that you're not training hard enough. There's an area of opportunity in your training. You could be doing something a little bit differently. Very seldomly do I encounter someone that's not doing enough volume. It's usually not what it is. It's just either the wrong kind of volume or the wrong emphasis with the wrong exercise at the wrong time. All these other factors other than like their effort. You know you're training too much when you're achieving your goals, but you're constantly having to deload. If you're having to deload every four weeks, I'm not gonna fucking lie to you, you're training too hard. You shouldn't have to deload potentially at all, but certainly not more than every like eight to 10 weeks. Natural hypertrophy, a lot of people ask me like my opinion on him saying bodybuilders don't need to deload. I'm not gonna totally agree with that just because I do think that there are areas of opportunity to reduce your training stress. But I, 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 for, I'm not gonna quote him on that, but from what I understand, just from the couple of videos that I've seen where he said that, he's not not saying that. He's just saying that you, don't, you shouldn't need to take a total week off of training or go so fucking weak and weenie in your training where it's not even very stimulative. You're just trying to maintain. Um, but if you're having to do that, like you don't have a choice or you feel like you hurt yourself, you're training too hard, especially if it's every four weeks. Um, and that's how you know if you're training too hard. But make it simple for yourself, man. Like if you're achieving your goals and you're reasonably recovered every session, you're training hard enough. Um, this is another good question. Will adding variations help prevent overuse? They can, they can also potentially fucking potentiate overuse. And, you know, we're so absorbed into like adding variation to prevent overuse, we won't even fucking see it coming. Here's the thing about exercise selection. Everything comes in a movement pattern, okay? So there is a squat movement pattern. There is a bench movement pattern. There is a deadlift or hip hinge movement pattern. If you pick all variations in the squat movement pattern, you're not preventing overuse. You know what I mean? Like you pick all exercises in the squat movement pattern. You're still knees over toes. You're still, you know, using your hips in the exact same way, your glutes in the exact same way. It's just the loading is probably a little different. The leverages might be a little different, but overall the movement pattern is still the same. So you're saying, okay, I'm doing a good job not doing 20 sets of squat per week and you end up doing 15 sets of squat per week. Like, dude, you're missing the, the forest for the trees. Um, a better way to look at it would be, like I break down in my bodybuilding uh, final answer videos. You have different things that you're trying to do with your muscle, like different ways that you're doing it, functions, strength curves, and so on. Break it down real easy. Have like, you know, squat variation, a sh you know, fully stretched variation, and then a fully squeezed variation. And then you have the same thing with bench. Bench, uh, like maybe like a mid-range exercise that we, I'll, I'll link to in that video, in, in the description. And then you have like a, a fully squeezed variation and then hip hinge, is, hip hinge is the same thing. Instead of just having uh, four sets of squat, four sets of leg press, uh, three sets of safety bar squat, and then three sets of belt squat, I'm doing a good job uh, avoiding overuse. No, you're not. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're just picking the same fucking exercise in different forms. It's like a, uh, the Spider-Man picture where all the Spider-Men are pointing at each other. <laughs> it's the same fucking thing, you know? But just like we talked about, if you're picking different exercises that fall within different categories, that's how you uh, diminish overuse if you have it or avoid it altogether. Very seldomly am I so just destroyed from my training that I have to fully deload or just fully remove a movement pattern. 
that really only happens if I'm lean like I am now still, even though I've been in a calorie surplus for a while, slowly gaining weight, but I was exceptionally lean. So I'm, I'm still gonna be exceptionally lean for a while. But that has less to do with like exercise selection and more to do with like just a reduced overall ability to recover. But for the most part, if you're just picking exercises in different categories and different movement patterns that may perhaps work the same muscle, that's a good way of avoiding overuse. Excellent question though. Vad Fit. He asks, does it make sense to train in a lower rep range like a power lifter during the cut? Here's the thing with that, bro. Here's the, uh, the, the misconception with powerlifting training. Powerlifting training doesn't necessarily not do higher reps. Um, you might be familiar with the term power building. A lot of you know, decently high tier powerlifters are doing what, what most would consider to be like a power building style of training. So they might be doing like a lot of weighted dips for high reps, dumbbell bench for high reps, and then like their main work that's like driving their strength progress, yeah, they may do like more specific lower rep work, but for the most part, they're not not training in higher reps. It's like when people call, I train powerlifting style. No, I don't. First of all, I don't even fucking deadlift. <laughs> I, I, I don't deadlift at all. I don't squat with a barbell, I squat with the safety bar. And I, I hardly do a competition style bench press. It's always some variation of those movement patterns that are still heavy, but I'm not a power lifter. And I always do sets of 15 and 20 and high reps and shit. Now you may be asking that because your thought process may be, well, okay, since I'm not gonna be building any muscle, I might as well just be trying to build some strength. That's a good way to think about it, bro, but you already should be trying to do that in your training program, hopefully. You already should be trying to build some sort of strength build some sort of size and build some sort of work capacity. Natural hypertrophy, to uh, uh, reference him again, I watch his content from, here, from, uh, from time to time. And one thing that he mentions, and he's a fucking bodybuilder, he doesn't care about strength really at all. He views strength as a means to acquire more tonnage to be a better bodybuilder, which is an excellent way to look at strength work for a bodybuilder. But he has still what he calls strength work. So he may open up a, a lower body day on one of his gentleman splits with like deadlifts for a set of one or two or fucking four or five, you know, pretty heavy, pretty heavy percentage. And then the rest of his work, which is the bulk of his work is gonna be like more bodybuilding. You can continue to do that on a cut, you know what I mean? There's, there's, there's really no difference between a good bulking program and a good cutting program, I should say, other than like maybe small things in terms of your exercise selection. And so you might do back extensions instead of uh, deadlifts or RDLs, you know, just like a, a lighter tier exercise instead of like a heavier one. But for the most part, your training really shouldn't change at all. It's just your rate of progress is gonna change pretty much. You still should be able to make small PRs here and there during a cut, but they just might be taking you twice as long to get versus if you were bulking. That's a great question though. I hope that gives you some food for thought. Croissant, if I fail, <laughs> you know the funny thing about you bro is, you've had so many different usernames on my channel but I can always tell it's you based upon the way that you comment. I'm uh, very analytical and very perceptive like that. Um, but croissant, you ask, if I fail my main lift, but I'm progressing in all my accessories, did I make progress? There's two reasons why that could be happening, bro. So like, first and foremost, yeah, you could be making progress for sure. There's a couple reasons why you fail that top set though. One, you were just generally under recovered that particular day to be able to demonstrate what is probably your top end strength and like your accessories are like, not as heavy as your main movement more than likely. Um, you could have potentially gotten that fifth rep if it was like a five rep max or whatever, but there was just like a slight deviation in your form which prevented you from locking out the bench or you know, getting that last rep on your squats or your deadlifts. 
where if you just waited a week longer, like in spite of your form breakdown, you still could have gotten the fifth rep, which to me is still indicative of progress because you, you know when you had that fifth rep and you just, it was a deviation in your form and you know when you just weren't strong enough because you don't even fucking halfway get the fifth rep or whatever it is. Now, there's also a scenario where you could be progressing in all of your accessories, but your fucking main lift isn't going anywhere. That shows you right there that there's something in your main lift that is an area of opportunity that you're just not addressing or you're not training adequately with your accessories. So, for example, we'll use, we use squats, for example. Since we, a lot of the times we talk about bench press, because everybody loves bench press, but I really love squats as well. Let's just say, for example, you're someone where you don't use your quads a whole lot on your squat. You're very posterior chain dominant. You're someone that good mornings your squats a lot, and that limits your progress on your squatting. So instead of playing to necessarily what you need to improve to improve your squat, which is improve your leg strength and your adductors and everything not having to do with your posterior chain you're just just hammering your posterior chain you know what i mean like so like you could have low bar squats as your main movement and then your accessories would be back extensions hamstring curls and fucking another posterior chain exercise like hip thrusts is a, a, a strange squat accessory that i see sometimes um, and you're progressing on each of those accessories and your squat just isn't going anywhere. It's just when you get to the good morning part, you're just good morning and it a little bit better, but you're not squatting anymore uh, effectively. You need to put in a quad based movement, maybe like a high bar squat or a plat squat where you're really high up. Your, your quads are getting biased a lot. And then maybe like a, a belt squat, a little wider stance below parallel where you're working your adductors a lot. Then suddenly your squat starts to look more like a squat and then your squat starts to go up. So those are the two main reasons why your main movement would be going up or it wouldn't be going up, but your accessories would be. These are excellent questions. Like we're, we're able to go very in depth with these. I appreciate these types of questions. I love to just answer everybody's in general, but these ones where we can really deep dive and people can go back and reference them. These are awesome and I appreciate y'all for that. Last but not least, another question from BQ, Raiders captain of the Noble Natties. Um, they asked again, is rotating weeks of heavy deadlift and heavy squats better for training quality and better sessions? That's a great question, bro, and that can go a lot of different ways. Alexander Bromley, big, strong man, motherfucker. I have a lot of respect for him. It's big like muscularly, I think he's kind of short, like in height, but big dude, strong guy, cock diesel, very smart. He's a, he's a nerd when it comes to this shit, in a good way. He's very analytical. He likes, in a lot of his programming, to space out his heavy attempts with deadlift every like 14 days, I think he said. His thought process being is that there's what he calls developmental tools in his strength and conditioning programming. Deadlifts are more of like a demonstration of his strength because he's a strong man. There's like deadlift for reps, max deadlift, deadlift for a set of three and so on. Um, there's the fucking car deadlift. Like deadlifts are more so a test or demonstration of strength specific to him. If you're a power lifter or you're training for power lifting, deadlift is less of a de developmental tool and more of something that you're using to demonstrate your strength or peak it. For him, squatting is more of a developmental tool. Barbell rows are a developmental tool. Hamstring curls, good mornings. Glute ham raises, RDLs, trap bar deadlifts, all these different exercises that aren't quite as stimulative in terms of like maximum strength as a squat or a deadlift, but you can train them with more volume and they develop more mass and more every day of the week strength, like more general strength that you can use to then demonstrate top end strength with that deadlift. That's the way he goes about shit. And you know, I respect that a lot. And I think there's a lot to take away from doing it like that. Even for someone that's a power lifter. Um, I think a lot of people, especially like newer power lifters, 
get caught in the minutia of trying to be good at every lift all at the same time because they see these Instagram power lifters during their contest preps, which as you should in a contest prep, do all three lifts at the same time and try to be good at them all at the same time. But if you're building strength and accumulating it just generally, there's different phases to shit. Now in terms of how you could implement that if you just didn't want to deadlift every 14 days, you could undulate it every, every week if you wanted to do more of like a, uh, a west side-ish kind of, kind of type of approach. So you'd have, you'd open up with like a top set. It could be like a top set of five or four or three or whatever you want if you don't want to do a single. And then you have like week one, I do my uh, fucking heavy pause deadlifts instead of three and then I do my back downs and then I do the rest of my work, which is my real bodybuilding and volume work. And then week two, I have these uh, these box squats and then I do some back downs for that and then I do the rest, you see what I mean? Like you're just doing a different variation each week. That's not my favorite. It does work. It does work well. I'm just someone that personally likes routine and being skillful at doing one thing consistently. Alex from Alpha Destiny really likes that conjugate-ish style approach where you have that main you know, opening variation and then the back down work. Either the Bromley style approach or the Alex style approach will definitely serve you well. But at any rate, spacing out your heavy deadlifts is definitely beneficial for your training. That's it for the Q&A. Lots of great questions. This was a really juicy Q&A. We're 30 minutes in. One final thing that I want to leave you guys with, and this will all be timestamped, for you impatient motherfuckers that don't like to fucking learn, but I've had to maneuver on my channel a little bit in terms of just different video topics that I had to get rid of just simply because of copyright laws and things like that. Um, we're gonna be remaking those specific video topics in terms of just you know talking about them in the midst of talking about things like the reverse safety bar squat, some variation I've been using lately where the camber is pointed up instead of pointed down, so it balances more like a fret squat and it's more quad dominant. Funny story about that. I was doing it on accident, you know what I mean? We'll talk about that when we get to the video, but I learned from Dan Green in a few posts that he made where he was doing reverse safety bar squat. I'm like, huh, so the camber's not supposed to point up, it's supposed to point down, and if you point it up, it's a little harder. Anyway, I say that to say we're going to be remaking some of these video topics and talking about them in the midst of other broader topics. If you want to watch things like my anime content, please do subscribe to my Patreon. It's five bucks to get in. You got to be a five buck player if you want to get in. Um, in terms of the three day program, like I said, I might post it for free. Games Goblin says I need to stop giving so much shit away for free. If that's the case, you gotta get in for five bucks and then you'll have access to that program for life. I do appreciate you. If you have any questions about these questions, please leave them down below. Thank you, have a good day.